You are listening to the Model Train Talk podcast. Each episode, RJ and I discuss various topics about the world's greatest hobby, model trains. The purpose of this podcast is to help promote, inspire, and bring a breath of fresh air to the hobby. Recording the podcast makes it possible to share stories of others and to help grow the model train community. Thank you for listening to the Model Train Talk podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Model Train Talk podcast. I'm RJ from RJ's Trains, and I'm joined by my co-host, Sam, of Sam's O-Gage Trains. Here on the podcast, we like to talk about the hobby, more particularly O-Scale, and we talk with community members and trying to build up a community amongst model railroaders here on YouTube. Today, we don't have a guest. We are just going to have a simple conversation, and I'll let Sam talk about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So yeah, we wanted to get away from interviews for a little bit and kind of try just discussion on trains. So we did have a very good suggestion by somebody, um, one of our, one of our close friends on um, social media and stuff like that. And they asked us, you know, what is a train that we would like to see that hasn't been made very much at all? So I'm going to let RJ go off and um, share his um, engines. He would like to see, um, you know, Lionel or MTH or, you know, something come out like that so so off the top of my head there were three that immediately came to mind and all of these engines have been produced by mth but now that mth is practically no longer with us it's it's going to be rather difficult to track down some of these pieces so the first thing that came to mind is a pennsylvania railroad g5 um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the g5 it's a 460 and they were used a lot on commuter services. And the Long Island Railroad in particular had 50 of them. It's been about 10 years since MTH last made the G5, and I think they've only done about two runs of it. So it's very hard to find. And us Long Island Railroad collectors, once we get something Long Island Railroad, we don't give it up because it's very likely that you'll never see it made again. And that's the case with the G5. And it's a very iconic steam locomotive. There's one being cosmetically restored over at the Oyster Bay Railroad Museum. And then the Long Island Railroad Museum has partnered with the Strasburg Railroad to restore one to fully uh, fully operational status where it would work on the Strasburg Railroad. And um, I'd really like to see Lionel get that tooling from MTH and make it, throw a whistle steam into it and the whole nine yards uh, because it's a real neat piece of Long Island railroading history. And it's something that I, in particular, really want to have in the future. But uh, what's your number one pick, Sam? My number one and my only pick would probably be the American Freedom Train, just because we really haven't seen a full set. I know it's a massive set, but um, I I can't really remember the last time I've seen an American Freedom Train. So, you know, kind of like on my future layout, when I continue collecting, Um, I would definitely love to have that piece. As you can see, I've already had the Bicentennial Special and the Presidential Mikado. So you you probably can tell that I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff. So I would definitely go for that. Um, I think it would be very cool for Lionel to slowly release a couple cars every so years. And it's kind of um, a collector's thing, you know, kind of like with the Presidential Series. You know, we have different runs of uh, Presidential boxcars that come out every so often. And these collectors snack them up. So... I think it'd be very cool for Lionel to release the train and a couple cars, and, you know, throughout the years, keep, um, keep producing newer cars that would have gone with the original train in real life. And it could be a um, big hit in the collector's area. So my second pick along the lines of the G5 is pretty much anything New York and Atlantic railroad related. For those of you who may not know what the New York and Atlantic railroad is, The Long Island Railroad got out of transporting freight in the 1990s because they weren't hauling much. And so they contracted it out to the New York and Atlantic Railroad. And so it's a short line railroad that operates on some of the tracks here on Long Island. And some of those tracks are less than a half a mile from my house. So I hear them go by every so often. And as far as I can tell, Lionel has only produced one New York and Atlantic railway item. And it was a bay window caboose, which the New York and Atlantic Railroad doesn't have. And they made that 15 or so years ago. And pretty much it's been MTH who's been making New York and Atlantic Railway railway stuff. Uh, They've produced nearly the New York and Atlantic's entire engine roster. If you started collecting it since the first one MTH put out. The only ones that they haven't met, uh, 
haven't produced were experimental engines that were given to New York and Atlantic. So just like the G5s, because it's Long Island Railroad related and it's a short line railroad that only Long Islanders really know, when MTH produced it, they made very limited quantities. I know they, they released a switcher, a SW1500, which I actually pre-ordered during my MTH panic buying. And that's supposed to come in relatively soon. It might actually come in before this podcast even airs. But um, so I picked that up, but I'd really like to see a GP38-2. I know a couple hobby stores still have one sitting around, but I'd like to see Lionel make one with the legacy because uh, I know they have the tooling. It's just, you know, taking the chance and producing that road name. Yeah. I personally, I don't see very many um, kind of those Northeastern railways much at all. Um, I mean, the only two that I've really seen are Pennsylvania and Long Island, but even the Long Island ones are hard to come by sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Lionel is good to make a Long Island Railroad item every few years. A couple of years ago, they did the Atlantics uh, in the Long Island scheme, which um, the, the Long Island had, you know, a lot of those. I think they had like 30 to 40 of those. And then two catalogs ago, they did the, they did the C420s in the MTA scheme with all the passenger cars and a cab car, which that was really nice. I wish I had the money to pick it up at the time, but hopefully I can pick it up sometime in the future. But um, I guess just my last, going off of that, my last engine that I'd really like to see Lionel make is a scale uh, M1, M3, M7, or M9. Um, some of you guys, that was just numbers and letters, but the Long Island Railroad has a, think of like the, uh, the bud cars that Lionel made during the post-war era, like the Baltimore, Ohio, you know, RDC bud cars. Well, the Long Island Railroad has something very similar. They're now made by Kawasaki out in Nebraska, um, but they're, they're called the M series. They had M1s, which are all now retired, M3s, which are now being replaced by the M9s. So they were produced in the late 80s, and there are one or two sets still running today. And then the M7s, which replaced the M1s in the early 2000s, and now the new M9s. I know Lionel did the ready-to-run set. I have the original Lionel ready-to-run set. I want to get the Lion Chief Long Island Railroad uh, M7 set, but I'd like to see the, uh, some of the older ones and some of the newer ones get some love. But I think we'd probably have to wait from a brass model from a, one of the brass producers to get that that's that's my list sorry for those of you who aren't familiar with the long island railroad but uh that was very long island heavy right there that was good i'm i'm learning stuff you're sharing all this information with me about you know long island and i i gotta go like look it up after the podcast you know just learn something new every day mm -hmm. oh and that reminds me i've got one more from the long island railroad the long island railroad also has these diesel locomotives they're called de30 acs and um, they have about 20 30 of them uh, that they use for places where the lines aren't electrified yet and if anybody's ever seen a amtrak uh, p42 it's a lot like that but shorter i have videos of the de30 uh, acs on my channel i'll throw a link to it in the description but there if you just Put it in the search bar, you'll find them. And the Long Island Railroad is the only one who uses them. They're the only ones that have produced them. Uh, we'll have them produce for them. So, you know, that's another model. I was hoping that MTH would make a model of that. I think the only one, only model train manufacturer to make a model of it was Athrin in the early 2000s or late 90s. And it was just a P42 repaint that they did in Long Island colors, which isn't accurate. But uh, yep, that that's that's actually my last my last uh, model train I hope to see produced by Lionel. You you sure you don't have any others there, RJ? It'll hit me in the middle of the podcast, but I'll keep it to myself. Oh no, you can let it out. It'll be fine. <laughs> All right, so we're you know that's a that's a lot of stuff um, that I think would be very cool. And the reason kind of why we talk about this is. We're interested in seeing something new and a new twist to the hobby. So um, our opinions, um, we think those particular engines would be very cool to add to the, um, the hobby. So kind of as we're talking about, you know, trains and thinking about the future, we also want to discuss with you guys and share with you guys 
a lot of the ideas we had for our future layouts. So we think this would be a really fun segment to kind of talk about what we plan and envision for our future layouts. So uh, RJ, would you like to go first? I mean, I, you guys still know that I'm working on my layout. My layout now isn't complete, but I'm actually getting ready to graduate college. So a lot's going to be changing in the next five, you know, three, four or five years. I still don't know where I'm going to be at, you know, next year. So because of that, it's more than likely that this layout's going to have to come down, you know, in the next year or two. Um, so my next layout, my uh, girlfriend and I already decided that she gets a makeup vanity and a walk-in closet, and I get the basement all to myself to build a layout. And um, I know for a fact right now, I want to use Gargrave's track. Um, I know a few people with Gargrave's on their layout, and they swear by it. Um, I've had nothing but problems with Fast Track, and I know I know it's because I I didn't do it properly. Like I didn't take the like, the amount of time needed to properly work the Fast Track. But from what I've heard from people with Gargrave's, for a more realistic and cheaper track. I could get better results with the amount of work I put into my fast track. Um, definitely want the, the bigger curves. I know Sam and I were talking about that yesterday. We definitely want bigger curves so we can run anything we want. And I haven't really decided what I want to you know, base it off yet. I know I want to include my home train station on the layout. I want to have like a Penn station because my grandfather worked at Penn station. He was a barber. But, you know, I also had a great-grandfather who worked for the New York Central, so, you know, maybe Grand Central Station. And then, you know, of course I want the mountains. So, yeah, I need a big basement is what I'm trying to say now. I think but, everyone uh, who yeah. has a hobby wishes they had a huge furnished basement. Yeah, I'll just take a uh, – I'll pull a book out of <laughs> Frank Sinatra's uh, playbook and build an entire house just dedicated to model railroading. I mean, why not? <laughs> right why not why not so for for my layout um i would definitely going along with the track i think track should be something that's durable and easy to put together and something that i shouldn't have problems with because it's the track like you're going to be using it all the time so i'd always as of right now i'm thinking going tubular tubular track right here i have it on the layout you know i've had problems with fast track before and like rj said that he, he wasted so much time trying to get it to work and whatnot. And I just, I just don't see that. Like, I know it has like the, the, what's it called? The, uh, the little plastic on the side. I'm the road uh, bed. Yeah. The, the plastic road bed, road bed the Thank ballast. You. Yeah. It has the ballast. It has a road bed. But when I would always play with fast track, when I first started getting into the hobby, it echoed no matter what I put it on, it always echoed. And it was really annoying. And so, you know, and then I spent so much time trying to get the electricity to go through correctly and, you know, trying to get, you know, the connection to go through and just, it was just annoying. I just hated it. And then when I put it all together and put it up here, I would always have a problem back there where I couldn't reach it. So I was like, okay, so now I got to go fix it. And then there'd be another problem over here. And it's just like, I just want to run some trains. So I, I switched to tubular. I pulled out some of my grandfather's track and you know, it works perfectly. And it's what, I mean, some of the, on the bottom, it still says made in like New York or, you know, made in USA. And that's pretty cool, but I'm definitely going tubular. Um, I already have, I'm sorry. Menards. You got to start stocking up. Yeah, I know. So I'd probably, yeah, I'd go tubular. Um, if I had the room, I'd go 072 or 096 um, with 072 switches. I just want to have the space to run anything and not have a problem. Um, and for, like, my modeling and stuff, I think I want uh, – what I'm thinking right now is I'm thinking a big rectangle, right? And so I want it to look kind of like this mountain up here. If you've ever been to South Dakota in the Black Hills, it's it's amazing. It's breathtaking so i want to model it after that and so i definitely think i have a huge mountain range in the back um, i have a couple main lines up there on the top kind of running around in the mountains um, and then down low um, i don't know like if you've ever watched i love toy trains or you know watch those videos where they have like where they display spectacular layouts but 
I really want to like when people walk in, I want that huge passenger station with three or four different lines. And I want to see all those F3s um, coming in and out of the station, like the Daylight, Texas Special, Pennsylvania, just stuff like that. That's really cool to me. I've always, they've always caught my eye. So there's that. And then I probably, I'd probably run um, F3s and I'd probably run um, steam engines with um, some freight. So I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, for the scenery, I would like to have kind of like a town on one side and then have the train travel kind of through the countryside. So I think that'd be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing like with this layout here, I've had, there's a lot of stuff that I've learned on this layout that I know I won't do in the next one. And one of those is to put the scenery last because I would put scenery down and I'd be like, oh, I want to have a new building up there. So I drill it and then I get sawdust everywhere. Half of my table's covered with sawdust and I can't get it off and it's, it's driving me nuts. Um, but kind of like in RJ's situation, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to college. So unfortunately, it'll be coming down soon, but hopefully it'll grow back bigger and better. So, all right, we've, we've both touched on Fast Track and we've kind of touched on why it stinks. But I know I've brought it up in multiple podcasts podcast and you know like in live chats and premiere about how much why i very much dislike fast track and while we're talking about it i'm gonna need my two minutes for grandstanding stand on my soapbox and you know air my grievances so lying out uh, the fast track it had pins in it and that's what conducts electricity now if one of those pins ever so slightly you know moves one way then you lose electrical connection even though the track pieces are still connected to each other and unlike guard graves or other track you can't cut the pieces of track to very specific lengths so if you need a six and a half inch piece you need a four and a half inch piece and then like three one and three eighths inch pieces because Lionel doesn't make an inch and a half piece they make an inch and three eighths and they make an inch and three quarters all right whatever but those little pieces, they, they die the quickest with the pins. Yeah, because you so, already cut them up, and they're already weakened already, mm-hmm. even with the pins in it. So on my layout, what I have to do is, is that I have to I cut pieces of wire, and then I have to bend it inside the rails to connect the electrical current from one piece of track to the other because my my trains will just die on one half of the layout because it doesn't get any electrical connection but um for somebody who's starting in the hobby and you know they're this is their you know usually you receive fast track in your starter set and then they build this bigger loop and then you know after time it fails and some of my fast track i'm using on the layout is you know probably close to 15 years old which i can understand why that breaks but you know, I go and pick up new pieces at the hobby store and they break, you know, within a month. That's why I'm going with Gargraves on the next layout. Nothing against tubular. Um, I just like the ties. I like, although we're running on three rails, I like keeping it somewhat realistic. So the tubular just doesn't do it for me. But my first memories of the hobby are I love toy trains, the trains running on the tubular track, the post war stuff. And so I'll, I'll always hold that, you know near and dear and i hope to build like a post-war layout now i've got uh, two post-war locomotives and a dozen freight cars so i'd also like to build a little post-war layout with all the accessories and you know the animation just something fun like that yep i would i think i would build a post-war layout as well but i don't i mean if i could figure out how to do it all on one layout i would probably do that instead of building two separate things yeah um just because well, like oh go ahead well our, fr- our friend steve colfrol yeah. if you if you look at his layout he has it wired he has it wired up so with the tmcc he can run his post-war stuff right alongside you know his scale sp cap forward and um he has one little section on the layout where he has you know three post-war accessories the uh the culling loader and unloader the uh barrel loader and i think the milk car too yeah, he also has the mill car. He actually has a lot of them now that I think about it. The sawmill, the, the stockade. Yeah, horse corral or stockyard, something. Stockyard, yeah, stockyard. And, one, and the logging loader. But anyways, I digress. So he's able to integrate that stuff and slowly out. 
which I think is really fascinating. For me, even if it's just like a, you know, a three by, you know, six piece of plywood and just one loop of, you know, 027 track, I think I'd rather do that, you know, just to keep the, you know, the scale stuff with the scale stuff and the toy stuff with the toy stuff. But, you know, I'd still want to have like a post-war rotary beacon on a scale layout because I think that's one of the coolest Lionel accessories. Um, that's something I don't have in my collection yet. Now that you kind of bring that up, I like Steve did a great job of integrating post-war stuff with mm -hmm. the modern stuff. Um, so but now he's building a post-war layout. That's true. He is <laughs> building a post-war layout. You kind of just destroyed my argument. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, if I, if I had the room, I would definitely lean more towards having a larger layout and having mixing it all together just because why not? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm already running tubular and going back to that argument um, with this tubular stuff, if a piece like goes together and it falls apart easily, you can literally just take some pliers, squeeze it a little bit to make it, make it a better fit. Mm -hmm. Also, um, it's very reliable, like I said before. And I mean, I'm already running three rails, so I don't see the problem. Like, in real life, running three rails, it's reliable. And like, if I wanted to hook up like a post war accessory, all I need is a little clip on piece and a couple wires, and I'm done. I don't have to do some fancy wiring underneath the table with fast track, or I don't have to buy a special piece that, you know, that essentially does the same thing as like a two dollar lock on piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, I might so, not. I, oh, go ahead. No, you finish your thought. I mean, it's it's not realist, not as realistic, mm -hmm. but it's easy, and I don't have to waste time on it, and I can spend more time decorating the scenery or mm -hmm. you know adding elements to layout that are personal to me, and I don't have to waste time dealing with the track. And like I have, I have, I have had no problems with this whatsoever. And mm -hmm. the only thing that I could see happening is like sometimes my trains run and the pieces slowly come apart. But all I have to do is take some pliers, squeeze the little little ends together so it makes a better fit, and I'm done. I it took literally a minute. And sometimes like the even the ties have little um, holes for like nails or screws, so. Uh, actually, yesterday I spent like 30 seconds drilling a couple holes, putting a couple screws, and now it's not moving. So, now would you? I know on your layout currently you don't have the track ballasted. On a future layout, would you ballast your track or leave it as it is? You leave it. I would probably figure out a way to ballast it, but um, I probably wouldn't like. I would probably. Isn't there like a little thing that you can buy that like. Is yeah, I'm pretty like sure that, that, yeah, there's like, it's like a rubber road bed. Yep. And I know that they make ones that look like that they're already ballasted, like the texture of it. But I feel like that somebody made one where you can sink the tubular track into it so then it looks ballasted. But don't quote me on that. No, that's, yeah. But I mean, I would probably have a road bed to help eliminate um, vibration, but I would probably put ballast on the sides and just a tiny bit at the top. And the reason why I say that is because I don't have to waste so much ballast. Because like if I didn't have that, um, that rubber road bed or whatnot, that's more ballast that I need. And that, that mm -hmm. adds up to a lot when you have a layout. So yeah. if I can have the road bed, put a little bit on the sides and a little bit on the top, enough to coat it, I've, I've essentially saved a little bit of ballast, if that makes sense. I know of somebody, and he had, like, a huge layout. He had, you know, it was his entire basement, and it was three levels. I think he said he had, like, 20 miles worth of track. Um, and what he did was, for his ballast, he went to a local quarry, and he asked them to crush up, you know, their already smallest rocks even more. And then he would just bring home 20, pounds ba 20 pound bags of ballast every so often, and that's what he'd use on his layout. So it's yeah. probably saved them a lot of money, you know. I, yeah, I think like a, a six pound tub of ballast from Scenic Express, which I, where I have on my layout now, it's it's like twenty five bucks, and then you have to pay extra shipping because of how heavy it is. Um, you're gonna hurt the UPS man a little bit there, but uh, <laughs> the, what I did on my layout, um, obviously I don't have ballast on the front, but 
in the back here, I actually took some rocks from my driveway and added to the bottom of the mountain. Mm. We'll edit in a picture there in a little bit, but essentially that's what I've done. So I don't have to waste so much money on ballast and stuff like that. So um, using your resources around you, I've definitely done that with this layout. There's a bunch of stuff that I've just found around the house that I've just added to the layout. No, like a lot of the, like all the hills that you see on my layout, it's uh, you know, it's pink installation foam that we had sitting around from previous projects. Yeah. You take you take twenty thirty minutes. You sculpt it up nice. You paint it. You put some scenery on it. You know you can even use leftover scenery, and there you go. You have a uh, you know a cheap little hill. Yeah, and that's what I've done with this too. This mountain is made. We, me and my dad cut it up. We literally just took a four by eight sheet, measured, and cut it up so it would fit over here. And then what I've done is you, there's actually a recipe for like homemade paper mache and you take old newspaper strips. And that's what I've done for this too. Um, and then to actually like form the mountain, I just uh, crumbled up some newspaper. Um, I should have put chicken wire over it too. You can do that as well to yeah. hold the newspaper in. So it's not so difficult to paper mache, especially if you're uh, sculpting uh, at a really high angle. Um, but one of the things I wish I would have done is I wish I would have added a couple more layers. I was super excited about how well this is actually turning out, and I just started painting right away before I added more layers to the paper mache. So around the tunnel portal, some of it's starting to warp off, but um, I'll learn, and I'll, I'll definitely uh, take it to my next layout that I build. So I actually have a lot of train decorations to go in the apartment right now that I haven't really shown off. I've posted a couple of pictures of it on Instagram, but that was a while ago. So I plan on doing like, like kind of an apartment tour of just like some of the train related stuff that I have in there. But even my first couple of years in, when I went to college and I lived in a dorm room, I always brought a Long Island Railroad caboose with me that I put up on the shelf. Um, you know, so I had that, a reminder of home, you know, of course, I still brought pictures of my family and everything, but I still had that reminder of home and railroading. And so, you know, any of you guys going to college, I suggest that it's just, you know, you won't be able to have a model railroad in your, you know, college dorm room, but having that one car of your home railroad, it, uh, you know, looking at it every so often, it's a nice little, uh, it's a little comfort away from home so yes. what i'm saying sam is that i expect to see a monon uh a monon or wabash freight car okay. in your uh your dorm room okay so that's an excuse to buy one right yeah okay yeah so yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome if your mom asks you why there's a new train at the front step you can say rj made me order it yeah it's just an excuse i'm yeah. just gonna put yeah. it on my desk for college i mean yeah whatever you need it it's a school essential it's just like bed sheets or anything else exactly like i have a pile of school stuff right here ready to go yeah. just that can right on top of there and, and i'm good to go all right so wrapping up here we just wanted to so wrapping up here on the topic of future layouts we were just thinking if there's anything that we have now or that we want to get sometime in the near future that we want to save for future layouts because we don't have room in uh, because we don't have room for it on our current layouts or it just doesn't fit with our layout. So I know I have a couple of things off the top of my head, but is there anything that you like, Sam? Um, I've been saving for a future layout ever since I started this. <laughs> um, when I started, I've been finding what I like and what I don't like, and I've been leaning a lot more towards the post-war stuff. So if you haven't seen my video on all my post-war stuff, I highly suggest you should check it out because yeah. um, everything in that video is what I usually run. Mm -hmm. um, That's a gr it's great video for any of you guys who haven't checked it out yet. It's, oh, um, thank you, RJ. I'm very flattered. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, um, I definitely have a passion for the post-war stuff. And going along with, you know, I kind of said earlier in the podcast that I wanted to have a layout with kind of everything if I had the room. Um, you know, I this, this year um, when the coronavirus hit, I think a lot of us, um, once we were staying at home and running our trains, a lot of us were surfing online a lot more than we should have been. So much. <laughs> a lot more than we should have been. And we were like, oh, I need, oh. That. I need that. I need that. Yeah, that was me too. Um, I bought oh. the turbine and I bought the uh, presidential Mikado. And I bought the presidential Mikado just because um, it's a collector's item. And I 
I'm, a lot of us are probably in this hobby to collect stuff and slowly get to like a complete set. So, you know, kind of, I'm preparing for the future. I saw this on Train World for about $300. And I was like, this is probably going to be a very highly collectible thing in the future. So I'm preparing now. I got it while it was at a reasonable price. And now I have the engine to go with the box cars. So now I don't have to hunt for a really long time to find the engine because I already have it. So now it's basically just the box cars and the cabooses. Another thing too, um, I picked up the turbine on eBay. That's about it. Um, I don't really have room for much since it's a four by eight layout. I can't run obviously like a, uh, like a big boy or something or like, you know, something like that or those really big legacy engines. So I don't really have room for that. So I think the only thing that I've really prepared for in the future is a finding all the stuff that I'm passionate about and finding all the stuff that I like. So in the future, you know, I am, I'm not wasting so much time and so much money to find something that I actually might not like as much. I mean, I, I, I can obviously sell it. And then the presidential Mikado, um, I know I, I, I would bet money that the presidential Mikado and that series of box cars and the caboose is going to be highly collectible in the next couple of years. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, it are, it already is a very highly collectible set. If like personally, two of my favorite presidents and two of a lot of people's favorite presidents, Kennedy and Reagan, you can't find their box cars anywhere. Like I've been, I check eBay almost every other day for the past year now for somebody to list one of those box cars and they can't be found. And I think part of the problem was, is that, Lionel overproduced the Mount Rushmore presidents. They were expecting a lot better reception than what they actually got. And so the next run they did, which was like Kennedy, Reagan, um, Eisenhower, and I forget who else, but they didn't make as many. They, only, they made a lot less. So now they're, they're a lot harder to find. Yeah. So I hope Lionel does a rerun of those. Of course, I want to pick up you know, the Mercado and the Caboose, but those are a little bit lower on the list. Yeah, and another thing with those two, I'm not. This might be an absurd um, comparison, but finding for me finding the presidential Mikado was like finding a highly collectible post-war item for a very reasonable price. If that makes sense. Yeah, I hear it. Just, I just know that like I couldn't even. I've been looking, and I've only seen one or two George Washington cars. Like I have John Adams, I have Thomas Jefferson. But I don't have George Washington, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure the critiqueness about me or why I'm so anal about that is just because I don't have the very first president. I have the second one that goes in front of the train first, and it just kind of it picks at me a little bit. So I'm like, I gotta find the first one, and I've just been looking and looking, and it's just it hasn't happened. So I'm glad. I'm really glad I picked up the train. Um, it's a very fun engine to run. Has a a beautiful whistle. A beautiful whistle. Um, the one I used in the intro, that was actually the presidential Mikado one um, because I couldn't find one that was um, that sounded really, really well and wasn't copyrighted. So. so I actually got really lucky with my Mount Rushmore set of presidential boxcars. There used to be a hobby store in my town, which kind of gives it away. They probably got their last shipment of new Lionel and MTH stuff in like 2008, 2009. And they were in business to 2019. So just that person's perspective, how much train stuff they actually sold. And so I was going in there, I think like 2016, like they originally got the set of four, like they ordered one set of, you know, the four of the original Mount Rushmore presidents. And I think I picked the last one up. I picked up all four there. And I think my la the last one I picked up was the Thomas Jefferson one. And I picked that up at like twenty in like twenty sixteen, brand new in the box. So I got lucky that way. But I don't know exactly how many I have. You know, there are the Lionel's made probably about thirty five box cars, and uh, you know, you really don't realize how many box cars that is until you're tracking them down and paying for them. I think I'm about I have twelve or so right now. I know you have. I have six. Six, yeah, thirty, thirty three more to go, something yeah. like that. No, way more than that. Yeah, 37. And another thing with that is too, if you're someone who's collecting, this is kind of con contradicting what I just said about the Mikado, but if you're looking for something, just wait 
it's out there. You just have to find the right time and the right moment. And then I'm going to overpay for a Kennedy and Reagan box car. The yeah. That's what I say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, just circling back to what we're collecting for our future layouts. For me personally, it's a lot more about the accessories. So I have a Lionel covered bridge that I actually have stored underneath the layout. I have an MTH Rail King uh, steel bridge that I have underneath the layout. And Menards recently came out with a new firehouse. And even though I already have a firehouse, and even though I already have a firehouse, the new one, the trucks come in and out, and there's a helicopter on top. Pretty cool, in my opinion. I come from someone who has uh, multiple generations of firefighters in their family. So it, it's rather a nice touch. And I just need to have a layout big enough where two firehouses are necessary. That's what that means. Some other things that I that I want to get um, just plain black Canadian Pacific steam locomotives. Um, I recently found out that my great grandfather, in addition to working for the New York central actually worked for the Canadian Pacific uh, in New York. And then Canadian Pacific actually asked him to relocate to Canada where his job in the, in the twenties. And my great grandmother said, no, we're not going to Canada. So I've been doing some research. A lot of the only Canadian Pacific steam locomotives that the manufacturers have made are the Royal Hudson's, you know, and the fancy maroon and gray paint scheme. Um, there aren't a lot of just plain black Canadian Pacific steam locomotives, except for the new 10 wheeler that's in the new Lionel catalog. So, um, you know, I probably won't be getting that, but. Maybe something a lot further down the line. But now if I come across something Canadian Pacific, I'm going to pick it up because um, I have no Canadian Pacific in my fleet right now. And if I do find something Canadian Pacific, I want to keep it around to the 1920 time span. You know, I'm not loyal to the, you know, the newer CP stuff, but you know, stuff from the 20s when my great-grandfather worked for them. Adding a personal aspect to your layout. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean... If I've explained it in bits and pieces throughout my layout update videos, but the passenger station I have on my layout now, that's the exact passenger station in terms of colors and shape from, you know, my town from the 1970s up until the 80s when they uh, moved it. You know, the, the town is based off of a town near me, you know, and just, and just little stuff like that. That's why. That's what you like about the hobby. You can recreate stuff that you see in your own, your own life in miniature form in a world that you create. All right. So I think that's the end of the show. Let us know how this went. Um, this is the first time that we've just sat down and talked trains. Um, out of nervousness, we might have um, said things a couple times extra or um, contradicted ourselves a little bit. But just let us know how it was, how it went. S so, and also, our next show is going to be August 14th. That's and what we're planning, yes. Yes, that's what our plan is right now. Um, this may be subject to change, so we'll post a video on the channel and our social media if there is a change. But as of right now, we're planning to do a live stream. Um, we're going to take a little break afterwards. There's just like a couple of weeks to get us acclimated to school and college and whatnot. So hopefully we'll be back first weekend of September, first Friday of September, something along those lines. But as you know, one last um, episode for the summer, we're going to try and do a live stream. So be on the lookout for that. Um, as of right now, we're kind of planning a Q&A session. So kind of like a live interactive thing going on where people in the comments ask us questions and um, we answer them the best of our ability on, on improv. <laughs> So yes. with no research or anything, so you're getting, you're getting, I'm sure we'll, there. I hope that uh, Tim Strains is there in the comments so you can correct us every time we, we uh, make an inaccurate statement about the train. We need that. Please do. Please do. Yes. We need that. Yep. That should be a good one, but it only works if you're there. So August 14th, mark your calendars. Um, as of right now, that's what we're planning. So make sure to check us out. Also, hope you guys like the new intro. Um, spice things up a little bit, bring a little bit more of um, attention grabbing to the podcast. Um, so that should be pretty fun. All the podcasts are now available on Spotify as well. So if you don't have time to sit in your train room and 
listen to it. Um, you can listen to it in the car or, um, you know, while you're on the plane, download them. Uh, make sure to go ahead and follow us on Spotify as well so we know that you're interested in it and we can keep going with this as well. So this has been the Model Train Talk podcast. Sam and RJ here. Hope you enjoyed the open discussion today and we will see you guys in the next podcast episode.